Good morning, Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Wednesday, April 12, and here are some of the stories we are covering. The UN Secretary General says Somalia is facing the diverse effects of climate change. Although Somalia makes virtually no contribution to climate change, the Somalis are among the greatest victims. Nearly 5 million people are experiencing high levels of acute food insecurity. At least 3,500 African Union peacekeepers have been killed in Somalia since the mission began in early 2007. Malawi's president pardoned a former minister jailed for corruption. The DRC concludes voter registration for this year's presidential election. Kenya's president says its government will not borrow money to pay civil servant salaries. We will not continue the old tradition of borrowing money to pay the current expenditure, to pay salaries. We are going to pay salaries from our own resources. And the Ghanaian immigrant drama brings African beat to the U.S. state of Tennessee. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez has appealed to the international community to step up its emergency humanitarian response to Somalia. Gutierrez arrived in Somalia on Tuesday for the Muslim holy month of Ramadan amid a worsening drought in the country. Ahmed Mohammed reports from Mogadishu. In his second visit to Somalia since 2017, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres appealed to the international community to give more emergency humanitarian aid to Somalia. Guterres said the Somali people deserve the solidarity of the international community to effectively respond to the drought and continue the fight against the militant group Ashabab. So I call on donors and I call on the international community to step up their support. To urgently fund the 2023 Humanitarian Response Plan, which is currently just 15% funded. Gautres says there was a need for a massive international support for Somalia, not only to respond to the humanitarian crisis, but also for the stabilization efforts and security in the country. Somalia is waging an operation against al Shabaab in central and southern parts of Somalia. Although Somalia makes virtually no contribution to climate change, the Somalis are among the greatest victims. Nearly 5 million people are experiencing high levels of acute food insecurity. And of course, rising prices make matters worse. World Vision Somalia Associate Director Ahmed Omar thought VOA the visit by Gautres raises the profile of the humanitarian situation in Somalia and shows the UN's solidarity with the most vulnerable people in the country. In January, the Somali government and the UN launched a 2.6 billion humanitarian appeal for 2023. However, less than 20% of that appeal has been funded. He says this is very significant for a high-profile personality as the UN chief to visit Somalia, especially at this time when the country could use all the support and attention to the crisis going on. Omar says the humanitarian situation in Somalia is dire and will require urgent and robust international mobilization of resources. He says Somalia narrowly escaped a famine declaration in 2017 thanks to concerted humanitarian efforts. This year, Omar says may be difficult because of the combined efforts of low funding and adverse weather predictions. Besides the drought, Somalia is also facing deadly fighting in the contested Las Ano town, which has resulted in hundreds of deaths and displaced thousands more. The war against al Shabaab is also moving to the southern parts of the country. During the joint media briefing, President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed urged the UN chief to lend support to the stabilization efforts in the country. Abdaziz Isak a security and political analyst with Hamid bin Khalifa Civilization Center says there was also an urgent need to finance the post Ashabab era in Somalia. He says the ongoing humanitarian situation in Somalia has many components and security is central. 
the call by President Mahmoud on the UN to fund the stabilization of newly liberated areas is very crucial. A success by visiting Somalia in the middle of a military campaign against Al-Shabaab. Guterres was underscoring the importance the international community attached to the campaign. He says, I think the visit by the UN Secretary General to Somalia is a major statement in not only mobilizing international aid and support for the drought, but also the ongoing war against Al-Shabaab. It's a boost of morale for the Somali government and the forces on the ground. Guterres first came to Somalia in March 2017, when the country was facing yet another deadly drought that UN had warned risked degenerating into a famine. Similar warnings have also been issued as Somalia experiences low levels of rainfall. Somalia expects the visit by Guterres will signal the urgency and gravity of the situation and provoke a quick international response. Ahmed Mohamed, for VOA News, Mugadishu, Somalia. At least 3,500 African Union peacekeepers have been killed in Somalia since the mission began in early 2007, with hundreds of others injured, the head of the group told VOA's Somali service, originally known as the African Union Mission in Somalia, or AMISOM. The operation's first deployment in Mogadishu came in March of 2007 with troops from Uganda. In April last year, the military exercise changed its name to the African Union Transition Mission or ATMIS with a view to withdrawing from Somalia by December 2024 after Somali forces assumed security responsibility for the country. Mohamed El Amin Suev is the special representative of the chairperson of the African Union Commission for Somalia and the head of ATMIS. He tells viewers Somali language service reporter Haroun Marouf that the mission has documented around 4,000 casualties with at least 3,500 of them fatalities. It was a good initiative, and uh, when that uh, started in Erashabele and uh, Haran, Atmis was there. Uh, our troops from Burundi and uh, from uh, Djibouti, they were there to give them support. They were fighting with them on the on the ground. And uh, after that, they went beyond uh, our area of responsibilities because you know that we have 23 FOBs, and those 23 FOBs have been established in area where there are concentration of the population, so then we can protect the civilian. So now they went very fast and they went far beyond uh, those FOBs, like uh, 95 kilometers away. So we were not able to follow them on the ground. If we had to follow them on the ground, we leave our FOBs and we leave those population that we're supposed to secure them, uh, we left them uh, alone. So what we could do to support them, we used the uh, ATMIS fighting helicopters belong to Uganda to give them air support and uh, information. Is it certain that ATMIS will leave by December 2024? This is the a Secret Council resolution, and uh, we will do our best. And uh, otherwise, if we remind, somebody should take care of the mission. And you know that we are supported by uh, the UN and uh, the European Union and UK. So then uh, we have to leave. Do you think the first phase of the military operation is succeeded? Yes, because now the situation is relatively calm in uh, the liberated uh, area. But uh, this doesn't mean that uh, Shabab has been uh, defeated 100%. You know, what happened in Mogadishu in uh, October 2022 uh, and in November 22, and recently uh, not far from uh, our camp, they are still there, but uh, they don't have, uh, I mean, the capability they had. Now they are under pressure. But I spoke to the National Security Advisor, Hussein Sheikh Ali, Yes. He told me yes. that their plan is to eradicate defeat al-Shabaab by this summer. Do you share that opinion? You know, uh, initially they were alone, but now with uh, the arrival of uh, uh, those troops, it is doable. Do we know how many Atmis and previously Amisom soldiers died in Somalia? Yes. I'm glad that uh, you asked that question because it's really uh, impressive when you go to Addis Ababa in uh, Julius Nyerere building and you see uh, that big wall that uh, you have the names of the people who died uh, in uh, this mission 
for peace and security. And at the same time, you see people writing uh, through social media uh, saying uh, that uh, those people, they don't do anything. But how they can die if they don't do anything in the mission? Mohamed Elamin Suwev is the special representative of the chairperson of the African Union Commission for Somalia and the head of ATMES. He spoke with VOA Somali language service reporter Harun Marouf. The Kenyan government is facing a financial crisis as the country is not able to pay civil servants for the first time in history. President William Ruto acknowledges that the country is struggling to pay debts owed by the state and that his administration will not borrow money to pay delayed salaries. As Maureen Ojiambo reports, Kenya is now looking for alternatives to stabilize the country, among them buying fuel products in Kenya shillings instead of the U.S. dollar. Thousands of civil servants in Kenya are threatening to boycott work due to delayed salaries as the country is facing financial instability. Kenya's President William Ruto on Tuesday said that the country is experiencing a cash crunch brought about by inflation and high dollar exchange rates. Ruto says his administration will not go into further debt to pay workers. Yes, it is the first time we are having delayed salaries, but it's also the first time we are having such monumental debts. I want to assure the country that that is managed. We have turned the corner. We will not continue the old tradition of borrowing money to pay the current expenditure, to pay salaries. We are going to pay salaries from our own resources. The county governments are protesting the failure of Kenya's national treasury to release money to them for the fourth consecutive month since December. This is the longest period that the counties have gone without receiving their equitable share of revenue from the treasury. The opposition in Kenya is blaming President William Ruto's administration as the country's finances dry up. National Assembly Minority Leader Pio Andai says Kenya's financial state is an indication that the country is facing bankruptcy. He blames the Kenya Revenue Authority for not collecting enough in taxes to save the country from the cash crisis. The government which is in power cannot run away from the problems that face the country by continuously scapegoating, by continuously backpassing to the old regime. Which we passed here a couple of weeks ago, there was no variation in this target of tax revenue, Madam Speaker. And therefore KRA has fallen short of its target. President Ruto says one way of stabilizing the economy is for the Kenyan government to buy fuel from the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia in Kenya shillings and not the U.S. dollar. Kenya uses an estimate of 500 million U.S. dollars monthly to purchase fuel products. Ruto says this will help bring down the prices of fuel and other commodities and that the move will ease pressure on the Kenya shilling against the dollar. Today, as a country, we can buy fuel in Kenya shillings something that many people never thought it would be possible. Let me tell you that from this month of April, all our fuel marketers and all the people in that space, they will be able to buy fuel products in Kenya shillings. Many Kenyans are struggling with the high cost of living as food prices and other basic commodities skyrocket. Economist David Ndi, who is also chairperson of Presidential Council Economic Advisors, says the economic turbulence is not only affecting Kenya, but the whole world. He says recovery will be tough. Over 60% of our revenue goes to debt payment. What are the implications of that? The implications of that is that you are going to have liquidity shocks. I think things are very tough globally. Our fiscal situation is very tough. The markets for frontier market countries have shut. But we think we are turning the corner. We have established our relationships with the international banks, which is very important. The government of Kenya has a debt burden of more than 68 billion U.S. dollars that is due for payment. The current administration had earlier hinted that it may need to retrench civil servants in order to pay the debt on time. President William Ruto blames the economic turmoil on the last government in which he served as a deputy president for misappropriation of funds. Reporting for viewers, Daybreak Africa, I am Moreno Giambo in Sacramento, California.
You are listening to Daybreak Africa on The Voice of America. I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Wednesday, April 12. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Malawi's president has pardoned a former minister of Homeland Security who was jailed in 2020 for corruption and placed on a U.S. travel ban. Ulade Moza was among 200 prisoners released as an act of mercy during Easter. But critics say his pardon raises questions about the government's commitment to fighting corruption. Lamek Masina reports from Blantyre, Malawi. The Malawi government said in a statement Monday that President Lazarus Chakwera has pardoned the former Homeland Security Minister Uladi Musa and also John Stewesa, a driver for the Malawi Electoral Commission, or MEC, who was sentenced to 15 months last year for obstructing a presidential convoy. Stewesa was sentenced alongside MEC Commissioner Linda Kunje, who was given 18 months on similar charges but pardoned last year. A statement says Chakwera has also pardoned 18-year-old John Musa of no relation to the former minister who in 2022 was sentenced to eight years for marijuana possession. Musa's sentence led to public street protests and a legal challenge for the sentence, which was later reduced to three years. The government says the pardon is in line with Malawi's constitution, which gives the president power to pardon prisoners who have behaved well in a prison. Michael Kayats is the executive director for the Center for Human Rights and Rehabilitation. He says the pardon of former minister Musa raises questions about the government's commitment to fighting corruption. The law allows the president to grant pardons on minor offenses, but this is a very serious offense, corruption. So it sends wrong signals that the, the administration is not as committed as the, the esteem. But also considering the fact that this is a politician, there's been a perception that the politicians always back each other. And the, this confirms that. In 2019, the U.S. government had imposed a travel ban on Musa, who was a special advisor to Malawi's former president, Peter Mutalika, because of corruption charges. The U.S. Embassy in Lilongwe told VOA by email, and quote, the travel ban against the former minister is still in place, and it has taken note of the pardon. President Chakwela has also reduced by six months the sentences of all prisoners, serving determinate sentences as a measure to decongest the prisons. Victor Mohango is the executive director for the Center for Human Rights, Education, Advice and Assistance in Malawi, which has long lobbied for decongestion of prisons. He welcomes the pardons, but calls for a speedy review of current prison legislation. Because the act that we are using now is an old version. It was enacted in 1956 so that we should be having a parole system. We are supposed to have a parole board checking on uh, the behavior of prisoners. We believe that the current system is prone to corruption because who assesses the disease of prisoners? So it could be the prisoners with names, it could be the prisoners that they feel like this can support us. We are only saying for this government, we have heard stories before. The government, however, said the pardons are an act of mercy toward the prisoners during Easter. Lamik Masina for VOA News, Blanta, Malawi. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Independent National Electoral Commission, Nua Seni, closed the voter registration and enrollment process in an area which includes the conflict raiding province of North Kivu. However, millions of voters remain outside the process. Congolese pro democracy groups are asking Seni to extend its operations until all citizens meeting the eligibility requirements are enrolled. Zaneb Neti Zaidi reports. Tuesday was the last day to sign up to vote here at this center located in Ndoshokota and everyone seemed to be rushing to get the registration room. Since the morning, people were pouring to get their voters card and many lost hope. This was the case of Nzigire Runiga, who did not earn any special favors or support for being a nursing mother. 
She says she arrived here at 7 a.m., but it is after 4 p.m., and she still has not received the card. She says the officers here do not have compassion for us, for people who are waiting. It is a mess. She and her baby are hungry, and she does not know when she will get in. At the Zanel Institute's enrollment center, it is the same story. The endless queues were visible until early evening. For many of the applicants there, it was difficult to get enrolled, so they prayed for an extension. John Kabo is a resident of Goma who stood in a queue. He wonders how they can enroll some people but leave others. He says they all are Congolese citizens. They recommend that authorities give another opportunity for people to sign up for their cards. The end of enrollment is also contested by several civil society organizations, particularly in North Kivu, where operations have been complicated by attacks from M23 and ADF rebels. These no governmental organizations also mention numerous technical problems that prevented many voters from registering. John Banyene is a president of civil society in North Kivu. He says Seni registered 22% of expected voters in one month and then they added 10 days. So he does not know how they could reach the remaining 78% of voters in such a short time. He says they are asking Seni to extend the registration. It's not acceptable for citizens to not be able to vote in the elections. According to the latest communique from the Electoral Center published on April 1st, tokens should have been distributed to all applicants on the 11th April. After that date, the centers are due to close. For VOA Africa, I'm Zanem Netizaidi in Goma. A remarkable African drama has made his mark on the music scene in the U.S. state of Tennessee. Born and raised in Ghana, Kofi Mawuko grew up surrounded by the rhythms and traditions of his homeland, and over the years he has developed a unique style that combines his African roots with contemporary influences. Viewers Arturo Martinez takes a closer look at the man behind the drama. My full name is Christian Kofi Mawuko. And I'm originally from Ghana, West Africa. I'm a full-time musician and also teach in the school system here in Chattanooga and around the southeast. I'm here to spread my culture and also Ghanaian music. I came here with a group 22 years ago, and then they did our little tour, and I decided to stay. So that's what brought me to Chattanooga, and you know, the rest is history. Yeah, I come here three times a week. Performance takes a lot out of my body, so I have to get my body in shape you know, to, to perform. Yeah, I've been living in this neighborhood for about 17, 18 years now. So paying the mortgage, <laughs> working hard to pay the mortgage, yeah. <laughs> yeah, very, very American. <laughs> From the beginning, it wasn't easy to adapt here because, you know, because of the culture difference. You know, uh, back home, when you walk outside, you see people selling the awards. So we have that outdoor experience, a community experience. But here, you know, just even now the sun is out, everything is bright, but there's no, there are no people, you know. So if you are in your house, you and your family are in your house. That's what you see every day. That was Ghana-born drama Kofi Mawuko in the U.S. state of Tennessee. 
And that's it for this Wednesday, April 12th edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for coming aboard with us this morning. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are also on YouTube, where you can watch our TV shows, Africa 54, Straight Talk Africa, and Red Carpet. On behalf of the Daybreak Africa crew, I am James Butt.